Ladies and gentlemen, joining us now is a man from Youngstown, Ohio. He was a running back for the Ohio State Buckeyes and led them to a national championship. Some controversies followed that led to him leaving the Ohio State Buckeyes. His life story is one that I cannot wait to dive into. An incredibly talented human who's been through a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, you can find him on the Business and Biceps podcast with Corey Gregory and John Fosco. He runs the Red Zone, a mental health and drug recovery agency, Maurice Claret. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty cool intro. Hey, I appreciate you, Maurice. And and I don't want to I don't want to take much of your time here. I'd love to dig right in because you have one of the most fascinating stories in the history of football. And I think your story does a lot of uh, motivating and inspiring to people about co- overcoming adversity and stuff like that. So let's get into it. You go to Ohio State. You're being talked about as the greatest running back on earth. Is that some of the most precious times you've ever had in your entire life? Uh, so one, uh, most precious, uh, I would say, yes, uh, very notable, uh, I think for, for any kid, you know, when you, uh, when you're playing football to ultimately, you know, go to a premier college and have success, uh, you know, I think is, uh, is, is a goal that, that a lot of young guys have and, uh, to that went there and to, you know, just, uh, the teammates that were made, the practices that were had, the memories, uh, even though they were short lived. Uh, those things were uh, those things were were better than great. You know they were fantastic, and to uh, uh, to accomplish so much in high school, and then immediately to go to college and uh, within a 13 month span, and to accomplish you know what we did in our uh, college, you know uh, I wouldn't trade those memories for uh, for the world. And you know those things happened back in 2002 and three, and uh, you know still to this day, uh, no matter where I'm at around the country. Uh, we were, I mean, I'm able to uh, still talk about those and, and, and leave some impressions upon people uh, that are lasting. Buckeyes fans love you for what you did for them. With that being said, the 30, 30, uh, 30 for 30 came out about you, and it seemed as if the AD wasn't the biggest fan of Maurice Claret, or he wasn't the biggest fan of possibly the situations that were happening. Is there bad blood there between you and Ohio State, or have bygones be bygones since then? No, uh, it, you know, just for the story, they made it, you know, for the national story, it came off like, you know, uh, I had a problem with Ohio State, but it was re- actually just me in a uh, in a tiff between the athletic director. And, you know, at the time, you got to take everything in context. At the, in the context, you know, uh, you know, he may have felt like he's got slighted for me. Uh, and you had two big egos that were basically going against each other. And you're dealing with culture, you know, power. And you're doing a race, you know. I'm, I'm the inner city black kid who comes and makes this big splash on on TV, uh, and then I'm just being totally irresponsible with my power. And then you have uh, him who, who who's not going to be pushed around or or disrespected by this kid who who thinks he owns the university. And so uh, I think if we if we both had a chance to do it over again, uh, that we will do it or we would do it. Uh, and that's kind of uh, where it was. But, you know, me and Ohio State, we've never directly had problems. It was just a, a disagreement or a way of how we should do things at 18. But, you know, I was 18 years old, and, you know, I'm pretty sure if you take any 18-year-old uh, and you give him a tremendous amount of power uh, and a tremendous amount of uh, uh, just leverage over a city where you have more people saying uh, yes rather than no, uh, uh, that, that that they may make the same mistakes. And so uh, everything is good between me and Ohio State. Now I don't make it down as much as I would like to uh, be at that, you know, just the distance from the university is about 40 minutes from my house, 30 or 40 minutes from my house. Uh, but I usually make it to a couple games a season. And, uh, and I'm just happy to see that, you know, those young guys are off doing a great thing this season. I don't want to dive into the negative, but I feel like it's a huge part of your story and a huge reason why you're so inspiring. Your exit from Ohio State revolved around a lot of situations. There were death threats I heard being involved. There was a lot of there was possible money involved. There was arrest. There was a murder, I believe, involved. What is everything? What is your side of kind of the events that unfoiled there for you in Ohio State's uh, kind of kind of interesting uh, separation? Oh, I mean, it was uh, it, the 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 irony. Like I say, everything was dramatized on TV. Um, my my reasoning for getting left or, or leaving Ohio State was something like uh, you know a fifty dollar check. Uh, all of the the lies 
uh, that I told uh, the NCAA. So for every lie that I told them that they want to go and investigate, you know, they, they gave me a, a sanction for, and I had about like 125 sanctions, and they were asking me uh, endless amounts of uh, questions about, you know, teammates and things that may have taken place. Uh, but I didn't, you know, I didn't have a, a, a situation where I was taking tens and, and not even a thousand dollars. I didn't, I don't have a situation where I was taking uh, thousands of dollars from boosters and cars from everywhere. Uh, I, I used uh, a car for a, 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 a used car dealership. Uh, the car had got broken into it in the process of the car getting broken into. I reported the car being broken into on campus and, uh, from there, uh, that was the extent of uh, of the car situation, and that happened like in April of 2000 or 2003. Uh, later on that year, they came back and they said, you know, how how could you, as a college student, have you know eight hundred dollars and in, in, in uh, three or four hundred CDs? You know, those CDs that used to be back in uh, back in the day in those big bookcases. You know, how could you have those things? And I said, well, those things weren't mine. They were actually in the car. Uh, that I used from the dealership because the car I recently got repoed and the dealer kind of let me use the car uh, because it was a cool looking vehicle at the time and that raised so much suspicion as if these were my items and literally if you look, if you go back and look into the text you know all this stuff is uh, easy to get your hands on it's public information uh, I didn't get suspended for anything like that it was like a, a $50 check I had received 40 or 50 bucks I had received from a gentleman to come to a kid's party uh, lying to the NCAA about my whereabouts and where I lived at. You know, I lived in my aunt's condo, uh, and I thought that that was illegal at the time, but I lied to him about where I was living at. And just not being forthcoming about everything that they asked me for is essentially why I got suspended. And uh, the, the, the turn came from this. Uh, most people don't realize that when you do get suspended, your your university has to recommend a sanction. And the, and the crazy part about it is that the NCAA – uh, said that they would have been fine with three or four games, but the, the university actually uh, uh, recommended the entire season or just suspended me indefinitely. And that's where uh, the bad blood became in with, uh, with me and Andy Geiger because uh, he had an opportunity to say, hey, I'll sit you out three or four games. The NCAA uh, would have been totally fine with that because it wasn't like, you know, I, I accept Fifty grand from a booster. They were like, hey, this guy just lying a bunch. Let's just put him on a recorrective action plan. Uh excuse me, uh, you know, slap him on the wrist or do something like that and get, get him back into the game. Uh, but the university uh, wanted to make a bigger statement. And the bigger statement was made because they knew they had Jim O'Brien, who was the uh, basketball coach at the time, uh, getting ready to get suspended. So they wanted to act like they were harsh on the stuff. And so Jim O'Brien, who's the basketball coach, and Andy Geiger, they're real good friends. And so, you know, let's oh. penalize hard to, uh, to Maurice Perret for the disrespect he's given and let's uh, lay a light on, uh, on Jim O'Brien uh the basketball coach. So there's a lot of politics, a lot of stuff that I ended up filing out uh, after the fact. But you know, that's that's water under the bridge. But I just gave you the story uh, just because you know, you know, you asked. Hopefully, it wasn't too much. <laughs> it was. I'll, it was amazing, <laughs> Maury. I just learned so much right there that I never knew before. Because the, the thought yeah. of the thought of the Gustapo NCAA finding down a sanction for every lie an 18 year old tells them, who's straight out of the streets of uh, Youngstown, who's finally getting a chance at the limelight. The, uh, the adults didn't seem to act like the adults in this particular situation. They seemed to like they acted a lot more like childs or children instead. Here, here, here we go. I give you I give you another situation that was comical, right? So uh I had a booster in high school, a gentleman uh who was a booster club of a high school friend. Or, or he's a booster club of ours, he's a, a friend of the program. Uh he ended up getting his cell phone my junior year in high school, right? And every month that he paid the bill, that was a different infraction. So instead of just saying, Hey, you use a cell phone and it was illegal to have a cell phone in high school, every month that the bill was paid, uh these people gave me an infraction. So uh, if you if you can round up, you know maybe thirty six months. That was thirty six of the hundred and twenty five infractions. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so you know when, when you look into this, if you go look at other people's suspensions that were highly notable, and they got like a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, when you when you just shake everything out, you know these facts aren't hard to find. When you shake everything out, this was like this was not um, uh, this was not like some big NCAA scandal where you know I had piles of money. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. It just wasn't like that. This more had to do with uh, uh, Jim Brown versus Andy Geiger and Maurice Claret uh, being uh, the person who disrespected Andy Geiger and said, hey, you know, these guys lied about sending me home. So this was a pissing match, but it, uh, but nonetheless, a lot was oh. learned from it. You know, 
uh, a lot that I would, you know, I wish I didn't have to go through, but nonetheless, a lot was learned from it, and I'm a better person because of it. That's all I can say. They're fucking 18 years old, though, at the time. I mean, so they fuck you over. You get suspended for a year. That kind of <laughs> turns your life into a complete different momentum than it was at. You're at Ohio State leading them to a national championship. I'm assuming the thought is I'm going to grind in this offseason. I'm going to keep it going. Hopefully, NFL hopes with how everybody's talking. And instead, your life goes in a complete opposite direction. Am I correct? Yeah, so, you know, I got suspended in uh... – this was probably uh, the biggest time, and, and you know, from being just a football player, right? Uh, you know, you have stress with performance, but uh, it's easy. You know, if you want to get better in the weight room, you go lift some weights. If you want to get better from a speed and agility standpoint, you know, you go and you know, run through some ropes or, or lift more weights or do whatever you think you can do uh, to best to better become a better athlete. But what actually happened was uh, I've never dealt with personal stress, right? And so when I was dejected from the uh, the actual university. And I was kind of like put on the sideline per se. Uh, I just didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know what to do with all that time. And in dealing with all of that anxiety, uh, what I didn't realize is that I found uh, the, the the mood changer uh, back in the bars. You know, back drinking, back drugging, uh, back smoking, and you know all this stuff just wasn't uh, a part of my program prior to going to Ohio State. Right? I thought that I was going to be like the next golden child and go with a couple Heisman trophies and you know work my ass off and eventually you know become you know become who I wanted to become. Uh, but that's not kind of how things played out. And uh, what it eventually happened was like you know I was just so stressed out. And so confused and so, you know, fucked up from the moment just to be blank, blunt with you, uh, just smoking weed and popping pills and drinking and, and having a ton of sex is what actually felt better, you know. But when I look back on it, uh, I wasn't doing nothing but just trying to alter my mood and, and, and escape actually, you know, what was going on. And so, you know, there, there's a few things people can't teach you, uh, and, and being famous is one of them, you know what I'm saying? Nobody tells you how to. Uh, steward the fame that you uh, that you receive when you're either a professional athlete or a collegiate athlete, and, and chances are, if you uh, you don't have a good support system, you know when when a huge adversity moment hits you, uh, you'll kind of stay in the same situation and be fucked. And and literally, I kind of isolated myself. You know, uh, the more success I seen guys have on the field, it felt like life was passing me by. And, uh, and eventually I just kind of like isolated myself and, you know, drinking and drugging became a thing. And uh, I just kind of le- like left away from the world. You know, I went out to uh, Southern California. I really thought that uh, hooking up with Jim Brown and going to, um, excuse me, uh, L.A., you know, at the time he had a, uh, a program called American where he was helping guys uh, transition from prison. I thought like just being around that vibe would help. Uh, but when I got to L.A., it was a completely different culture. You can drink and drug all day and nobody says shit. And so when I got out there, uh, it was just uh, it was it was more of the same stuff that I was doing in Ohio. And, uh, you know, uh, when, when nobody's kind of like there to check you or hold you accountable, uh, you can become self-destructive and not even know it. And kind of that's what happened. And uh, eventually, you know, everything kind of caught up to myself with uh, going to the combine. I went to the combine and I thought like wholeheartedly. I was like, man, I'll go to this combine and perform very well. And, and, and I'll kind of recorrect everything, but uh, just the abuse from the uh, prescription pills, the partying, and the kind of fucking around, everything had came to a head, and uh, and, it's, and eventually uh, things just kind of went from, went downhill from there. Were you running? Were you uh, selling drugs and shit like that, or did I hear that wrong? No, yeah. So when I, when I was done with football, I didn't have a way to uh, take care of myself, and so I literally said, you know, what am I going to do to take care of myself? And I just got back into the streets, and so. Uh, just like any other guy, you know, who, who's participating in street activity, you know, in between selling dope and selling marijuana, uh, it was just kind of like my thing to do. You know, it's kind of how I took care of myself. You know, when you look back on it, you know, uh, and, and I just want to mention it just because your platform is so huge. You know, oftentimes with these young guys, we go to these universities and we actually think that we're beating the system uh, by – uh, about, about going to these bullshit classes. You know, like when I was at Ohio State, I took, you know, officiating golf, officiating softball, independent studies and women's studies. And uh, in the time, in that time capsule, you think it's a joke. You think that you're beating the system. Uh, but when the football is no longer an option and you can't physically play and uh, uh, that university isn't part of your life, you know, when you got kids and responsibilities and you have all of this other stuff, 
uh, that is uh, that, that are real things in your life, you start to realize that you weren't taught shit, that you were just basically pushed through a system and used for athletic ability. You know, a lot of these guys, including myself, come from felling school districts, and I just think there's a responsibility that the university should take that, you know, even if we're not going to get you uh, the greatest of scholarships from here, if you can't academically perform, we should at least take an initiative to uh, raise your current level of uh, reading, literacy, uh, uh, mathematics, and everything else. And so that was just uh, my, my two cents on this. So when it happened, you know, I just turned back into the same character I was, you know, before football started. Uh, and eventually, you know, what was I doing before I got into football? I was into crimes and, and all the stupid shit like young kids and football kind of saved my life. But once football uh, uh, didn't factor into my life anymore, I wasn't able to play. I turned back to the same kid, you know, just a big ass kid who can play football, uh, who thought that, you know, just being a gangster was more important than growing the fuck up. And, and that's and that's it in a nutshell, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. It's at West Virginia. We had a lot of guys who couldn't even read, but they were there, and it was just a situation where you really do watch the university just use them for their athletic ability. Now, granted, they're getting a lot out of it too, right? A potential opportunity to get out of the streets, move up, move on, potentially make the NFL and all that shit. But if it fails, there's not a lot to fall back on. Whenever your degree is in athletic coaching education, there's not really much you can do. So I see that all the time, and I respect you coming out and speaking about it. Let's get back to, did you work for a gang? Were you being by yourself? Did you try to build your own empire? No, no, no. I, I was literally by myself. You know, I ran with guys in my neighborhood. Uh, I come from Youngstown. We don't have, uh, gangs are not super prominent. Guys are are, are more um, uh, geographically. They are, if you're from the south side, you you know tend to hang with guys from the south side of your neighborhood or north side or east side or west side or whatever you have it. So it was just pretty much the activity amongst me and the guys in my neighborhood. Too many Italians there, too. You got a lot of Italians there. <laughs> yeah, yes, we, we, we do have a... a but it, 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 it wasn't but a bunch of Italians, but we do have a, a bunch of Italians uh, in a rich Italian culture uh, within the city of Youngstown. Too many, man. I'm from Pittsburgh. There's too many fucking Italians. You're, there's four. Oh, so, you're, so you're right next door. Yeah, you're right next door. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a lot of Italians. Uh, so now I see you. You do a speaking circuit. Uh, you're out there basically telling your story, and I, I assume that's to inspire and to motivate others uh, that they can overcome adversity as well. Uh, why don't you talk about that a little bit? How can people book you if they want you to come talk? Your story is incredible, and you coming out on the other side of this as professional and clean as you are is very remarkable. I hope you know that. Yeah, so uh, I mean, most, of, most of my speaking engagements are booked at mauriceclaretonline.com. Oh, I, I do three things. Speaking is probably the least of what I do, but it's probably the most visible. Uh, and so uh, I do speaking engagements. I've spoken probably the over 400 times to uh, different universities, uh, businesses, uh, whatever whatever you can name. I've probably spoken all, on these different platforms and at these different venues. Uh, but everything is booked through, uh, um, excuse me, uh, mauriceclaretonline.com. Uh, also, uh, one of the, uh, one of the other bigger things I do is uh, business and biceps with uh, Corey and John Fosco. Uh, that is uh, one of the things that I think this, uh, I, I call it like my therapeutic platform. Uh, I, I love those dudes and, and what we're able to do on a weekly basis. And I also uh, run the Red Zone. The Red Zone, uh, we're a mental health recovery agency for adults and adolescents. Uh, I probably employ about 150 people now. Uh, we're uh, awesome. uh, both in the city of Youngstown, also Columbus, where I live at. Uh, I travel back and forth uh, running uh, both offices and places. And uh, a lot of what was learned either through uh, mental health, I call it mental wellness, uh, the importance of mental wellness and, and people being mentally fit and well and understanding that is a thing just as much as we understand that physical fitness is a thing. And, you know, if you want a bigger chest and bigger triceps, there's many different platforms uh, that you can go and find that. But uh, uh, understanding that mental wellness and your mental fitness uh, to endure all the stresses and traumas and, and, and situations of life, that those are things and, and ultimately neglecting my mental health is what kind of put me in a downward spiral for 10 years. And I'm using a platform when I go and speak to people uh, and tell my story I'm talking about and raising awareness and giving education that these are things. But be it through be personally speaking, the platform, the podcast, 
or the, uh, the, the, the technical part uh, with our facility with social workers and counselors and everything. I love uh, working with those people uh, because, you know, we, we directly tie into what's going on inside the country. You see a lot of people uh, going through personal shit, be it trauma, be it stress, be it, be it everything through this opioid epidemic and, and relating uh, your mental wellness or your mental fitness or your mental condition uh, and the linkage or the correlation to it uh, is highly important. I just try to use my story. Uh, to inspire, to motivate, and to encourage. That's fucking awesome, Maurice. You're a hell of a human, brother. I hope you know that from the streets of Youngstown to what you're doing now is absolutely incredible. I, I, I do hope you know that you are inspiring, encouraging, and motivating humans on a regular basis. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and chit chat. Quick question, though. I don't want to bring it back up. At any point, did you think you were the next Pablo Escobar or anything when you were selling drugs? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't just like this. I, so, so I think just, just like everything else, I think every kid, uh, e- even when they're doing uh, uh, illegal activity, you know what I'm saying, I think that every kid wants to uh, have success uh, and, and, and they want to be the best at what they're doing. And I'll say this just to, just to make it known, because, uh, you know, some people, this is the Internet world, they take things out of context. It's not nothing that I, I, I promote, you know what I'm saying? Uh, if I can do it all over again, I probably wouldn't do uh, most of the stupid shit that I've done. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to come out on the other side because, you know, fuck, I could have been dead. I could be in jail for a lifetime. I couldn't be on this platform talking to you. And, uh, and, and just being here, being healthy, being a sound mind. Uh, and being able to speak, you know, from where I'm at right now is, is a blessing. And so I appreciate the opportunity, my brother. Uh, it's cool. Like, I had no clue that, uh, that that your platform was as huge as it was uh, just because I wasn't just dialed into the Internet. Even though I'm on the Internet all the time, I wasn't <laughs> just dialed in. But it's cool to see you transition and take uh, what you've done uh, to different heights just being a fellow football alone. Well, I appreciate that, and not a lot of people know that I'm a monster, Maurice. It's just uh, I just live out here. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you so much, man. MauriceClaretteOnline.com, Business and Biceps Podcast is a very good one, and what you're doing with the Red Zone is incredible. Thank you so much for opening up here, and it's nice to know that you do have that elite mindset that no matter what you do, you want to become the best. I respect that so much. Ladies and gentlemen, an absolute legend of a human, a man that's going to leave a lot more good than any of the small negative he has done in this world, Maurice Claret. Thank you so much, Maurice. Thank you, my brother. Hey, cheers, man. Take care. All right, thank you.